I am Dr. Kirk Hinckley. I am a practicing emergency physician in the northeast corner of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm also the director of education at Vapotherm, and I am happy to introduce um, three emergency or pediatric emergency physicians and uh, general emergency physicians um, who are going to speak to us today about um, uh, post-COVID use of Vapotherm in the pediatric and uh, mixed uh, mixed population emergency departments. So we have Dr. Rebecca Ramey, Dr. John Misdery, and Dr. Adam Hennessy. And Rebecca, I'll have you introduce, introduce yourself first. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Rebecca Ramey. I'm a pediatric emergency physician in Columbus, Georgia, which is a, um, a medium-sized town. I've been here for almost seven years, and I've been practicing pediatric emergency medicine for 20 Let's see, 26 years now. Great, and John? Uh, so my name is John Mazzeri. Uh, I am a dual board in EM and pediatric EM. Uh, still practice both. Um, I'm in Western Florida. Um, I uh, work in two separate pediatric emergency departments. Uh, one pre-COVID volume saw about 55,000 kids a year, a major coordinated referral center and a secondary peripheral site saw about 18 kids a year where every single the kid has to be shipped out. Gotcha. And I've been practicing, I'm oh, sorry, practicing pediatric emergency medicine for, uh, this is year number 11 for me, general emergency medicine uh, for 13 years. And, and John, you are also the chair of the Florida ASAP PEDS uh, committee. Yeah, and so I, I'm the uh, state chair of the Florida ASAP pediatric committee. So that's what, it's what, I, what I do in my free time. Great, Adam? Hey, my name is Adam Hennessy. I'm a general emergency physician. Uh, I practice in Philadelphia and just outside of Philadelphia. I'm the medical director of two hospitals, uh, our group. We both sites are about 25,000 volumes, uh, well, pre-COVID a little bit less now, um, and probably about 10 or 15% pediatric. Uh, I worked for eight years full-time at a hospital in Camden, New Jersey. There was about 60,000 volume and 25% peds uh, where we had a high acuity level there. And we we're very frequent and high users of vapotherm technology then, and we've brought that experience to our sites here in Philadelphia. Great. How does high velocity therapy fit into your armament uh, in treating really the sickest of the bronchiolytic patients? Yeah, so most of the time for a baby that presents in respiratory distress, high velocity is our go-to therapy. We don't usually go right to CPAP or BiPAP unless the baby's having periods of apnea because then as you know they need some they need some positive pressure but as long as they're not having apnea it is our go-to therapy for patients with bronchiolitis not just because of the, the help with hypercapnia but obviously to help with the thick with the thick uh, thick lower airway secretions that babies with bronchiolitis have so it really is our go to therapy for those babies in respiratory distress you know we saw so much bronchiolitis um, last august was actually our busiest month month ever, we opened as a department in June of 20, 2013. And with that weird RSV surge that we had in, in August, we were using it a lot then um, in those little babies. And for lack of a better term, how are you, how are you setting the vapor therm or how do you dose your vapor therm and, and how do you titrate it in those folks? Yeah, so we, for the little tinies, we usually started about two liters per kilo per minute. Um, and, and that, uh, because again, it's in the open system, we don't have that worry about pressure injury that we would worry about with CPAP or, um, uh, what the you know traditional high flow na nasal cannula. So we usually start at about two liters per minute and then we can usually dial down uh, pretty quickly as they need it. And of course we can adjust the flow and the oxygen uh, and the FiO2 separately, which is good too. Great. And John, how about some of your experiences with bronchiolitis? Uh, so for me, I can't, uh, I, I never use BPAP, uh, BiPAP on a neonate uh, from uh, my standpoint and uh, CPAP, ultimately, um, if they're having periods of apnea in the department, usually their mental status is starting to fail, uh, which means for me, if I'm at my, uh, my external site, I'm probably going to intubate them uh, if vapotherm looks like it's failing and they're having periods of apnea, uh, which is the same thing you do essentially with CPAP if they're having worsening mental status and long, long periods of apnea. You're essentially be doing the same thing. So from my standpoint, if they're going to fail vapotherm, chances are they're probably going to fail CPAP. Um, and in the, the adult literature kind of already kind of improves that, you know, you, 
you're gonna, if you fail vapotherm change, you're probably gonna fail BiPAP uh, and you're probably headed towards intubation anyway. And you're probably just too far gone and probably somebody's brought you in a little bit too late. Uh, but for me, it's, it's, uh, it's vapotherm, 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 as long as your mental status allows it and intubation isn't immediately needed. Um, that's, that's, good, uh, that's essentially my go-to. Uh, and at my peripheral site, uh, I'm finding myself titrating them down. Uh, essentially, I try to get the oxygen levels down as quickly as possible uh, to uh, kind of prevent any sort of kind of high level of uh, you know, oxygen injury and kind of decrease respiratory drive. But usually the flow is what helps us uh, more than anything else. Gotcha. So you're starting them high as well? You're starting them on high leaders? So yes. Uh, so for me, I, took, I work in the emergency department. So for me, I don't do anything halfway. Uh, so for me, I'm going to start them on uh, two liters a minute uh, and uh, for uh, two liters per kilogram. Uh, and then essentially for me, titrate them down from there. Because uh, if they don't, uh, if they're improving rapidly, uh, you can go ahead and titrate that system down. It's not very hard to do. And they titrate down twice, very, very quickly. And like Rebecca said, it's an open system. So it's not like you're going to create any sort of injury with the amount of flow they're giving him. At most, you're giving him a peep of five. Uh, it's pretty much the maximum you're going to go. All right. And Adam, tell us about bronchiolitis in your shops. Yeah. So from my standpoint, in all the years I've worked in, I've never found any ER adult ER docs managing peds or respiratory in the community that's overly comfortable with CPAP or BiPAP on kids. Um, I personally, outside of residency in the children's hospitals, we haven't, I haven't used it clinically. I'm either putting them on vapotherm right away, or I think they're too sick and we're going right to intubation, but most tolerate it really well. So luckily we can avoid that in the majority of them. But I think from a I know what I know, um, and I'm comfortable with vapotherm. I'm comfortable with airway management and airway control on these sick patients. CPAP on a kid is, I just don't feel as comfortable with managing them. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. I just wouldn't, if they're getting that bad, I think like John was saying, I'd rather just take control of their airway and um, manage them with full mechanical ventilation than using a CPAP. But that, that's purely my comfort level from also my training and my clinical experience. Have you guys ever had to, to use sedation um, to help a patient, a pediatric patient, tolerate a vapotherm? No. I haven't. No. no. I, I think uh, putting them in mom's arms and letting mom hold them is probably all the sedation that you need. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's, let's um, kind of move to an older population and hopefully... Um, something that we're not going right to intubation with, and that's the asthmatics. And, and so I'll ask, how have you guys incorporated high velocity therapy into your treatment of, uh, in particular, status asthmaticus, um, which has both a hypoxic and hypercarbic um, component to it? And we'll start, Adam, we'll start with you. So the the majority that come in, um, I feel, especially thinking about the kind of adolescent and pediatric population, the majority don't need supplemental oxygen from my standpoint beyond, you know, you know, a couple liters that can honestly just be delivered if we're driving the NEBS with oxygen as well. So th those are the easier ones, the straight up um, asthma exacerbations. But like you said, the, the status asthmaticus, the, the really sick ones, we'll put them directly on um, uh, the liters or the vapotherm at the max liters per minute for whatever cannula we've selected and their weight. And we'll just run the nebulizers right on top of that as well uh, while doing all of our other um, treatment options. We don't use the aerogen adapters at my site. Doesn't mean they don't work, but I've had great comfort using the nebulizer treatments just as a mask on top. Some places will adjust the flow rate. We don't even adjust the flow rate. Uh, I found that the, I feel like the, the patient's going to <clears throat> wash out their entitled CO2. They're going to take a bigger deep breath. You're going to improve your tidal volumes. That's going to make up for whatever um, difference. Then maybe there might be a concern that you might be washing out some of the NEB treatment, I think, with the flow, increased flow rate. But I haven't had any experience where I've had to back off on the flow rate. So we'll just put them right on the vapotherm unit. We'll put them right on a continuous NEB while we're doing our other treatments as well. Okay. And Rebecca? We do uh, kind of two different ways. We don't use the inline uh, aerosol, but we do either placing an additional mask with the nebulizer treatment, or sometimes we'll take them off vapotherm just long enough to give them a short treatment, uh, depending on how much distress they're in. If they're not in severe distress, sometimes we'll just take it off just long enough to give it um, 
to them. But, you know, just coincidentally, I worked a shift today and I have a 10 year old asthmatic who came in in respiratory distress. I gave him a treatment. He got a little bit better, but then he got that whole VQ mismatch thing going and started feeling sick to his stomach. And I said, well, let me just put you on Vapotherm. And so when I checked him out, it was like, give him Vapotherm for a couple of hours and he might be better and well enough to go home. Um, because just, he looked uncomfortable. Um, he still had some wheezes. I gave him another treatment, but he just looked uncomfortable. And I thought that would probably make him feel better. And, and it did, I went back in to check on him and he'd been admitted in February and mother had even said at that time, Oh, he got vapotherm and he got better. I said, well, let's, let's give it a try then. Yeah. I know, I know ABGs aren't, aren't a big thing anymore now, but do you see a rectifying of the the, the raised um, PCO2s or if you're using entitles or what have you, do you see a response um, with the high velocity therapy to those numbers with asthma? Is that one for me? Yeah, you can, you're, you're going, yeah. go ahead. Um, definitely. Now, this kid wasn't sick enough really to need a blood gas, but we do. Sometimes if we feel like they're um, ill enough to go to our intermediate care unit, we, we might check um, a gas, but we, we don't follow them as quickly as they would at an ICU. Because I'm in a community hospital without an intensive care unit, we only have a, an IMCU. Um, we don't use them as much. It's more of a clinical picture. But for those um, sicker kids, sometimes we will get a gas and, and respond to an elevated CO2 with uh, changing their therapy, increasing their flow, or switching them from uh, regular nasal cannula or non rebreather to uh, high velocity. Okay. John? Uh, for me, uh, if they're going to the ICU, they're getting gases, uh, and chances are if there's any, if they're in the ER for more than an hour or so, they're probably going to repeat gas um, from, from uh, the respiratory therapist. Uh, and usually most of the time you will see an improvement of the PCO2, the PO2, uh, they'll be less acidotic as well um, from there. So um, I will say it aside, our, our RTs actually wish that uh, almost all of the vapotherm uh, nasal cannulas were the origin. Uh, because we just use it so much with our asthmatics uh, that it's essentially become almost an automatic thing uh, that uh, for them, like anyone in the pediatric size range, uh, they, they just wish that was just the automatic go-to nasal cannula uh, because we just use it. Even our, our uh, most of our pneumonias happen to be in asthmatic type patients uh, as well. So uh, they just, if, if that was just the only thing that was released in the pediatric nasal cannula, they'd probably make a lot of our RTs happy. So. Yeah. And Adam? So um, we, as just in my practice, and I think most of the docs in my, my group and where I've worked previously, uh, we, we don't usually, we do a lot more kind of just at the bedside reevaluations, might drive venous gases, but rarely are, unless they're incredibly low, we draw on arterial blood gases. So I, I tend to not as much, especially in the pediatric kind of draw serial venous gases, but by the same token, we don't have any inpatient pediatrics. So any patient that is sick enough that they're going to be on prolonged uh, vapotherm or any other uh, treatments going to be transferred out to. So we'll, if we have to reassess it, we will. Anecdotally, in the adult population, I've definitely seen the pretty significant changes in the in the PCO2 uh, as well with with treatment. I, I just personally don't trend it as much in the pediatric population because we're usually working on transfer and level of care at that point. Gotcha. Now, have in, in any of these sick kids, uh, whether they're asthmatics or, or, or what have you, have any of you seen any pneumothoraces in, in a PEDS patient with, uh, with Vapotherm? John, I have not. Okay, John? Uh, I have never seen one. I actually, I looked this up and there's a handful of case reports and they even question like, what a kid had a known history of having spontaneous pneumothoraces in the past? Uh, the uh, other kid was like, I guess I uh, had uh, a, um, but, uh, but it was all pretty much at risk people um, who probably uh, would have uh, acquired a spontaneous uh, pneumothorax regardless, uh, and probably may have gotten it because they were placed on vapotherm and then the chest x-ray was done. So there was, I've never seen any sort of case report that says chest x-ray was negative, placed on vapotherm chest x-ray done again, and lo and behold, they have a, they have an iatrogenic I I have never seen a case report that's been like that. Gotcha. Rebecca? I no, have no. not. Yeah, I, I have not seen it. Adam? Same. Act. Okay. All right. So we'll move on from that. Um, we'll talk about kind of all spectrum of peds, including those that are kind of physiologic adults. Um, 
any conditions that you see that have a hypercapnia component that uh, that you would address with with high velocity therapy? And if you guys have any examples that you could share with us, where um, maybe um, what you would do, maybe in an adult patient with with treating hypercarbia with vapotherm, and how you adapted that to to your patient. Yeah, I'm sorry. People get up, maybe kind of, uh, see, this is a surprise. I had a 16 year old with fentanyl overdose that ended up on an Narcan drip. Uh, that was extremely hypercapnic, uh, mental status, didn't really require intubation. And I didn't really want to put them in a BiPAP mask. Uh, and I put them on vapor therapy. Uh, and I went ahead and I checked the gas on them uh, when they initially got there. So do I really need to, and this gas looks like someone who probably needed to be intubated. Uh, and, but saw the gag reflex, which is still respond. We're putting them on an Narcan drip. Uh, put him on vapotherm and his gas is significantly turned around an hour and a half later. Um, so, I mean, somewhat somnolent on the Narcan drip, though we were increasing doses, but the gases looked better. A person was, a person was actually perking up and waking up. Uh, so for me, I mean, it's, it was a, a tool to avoid intubation in a teenager uh, who essentially uh, made some bad decisions. Uh, Rebecca? I can't say that I have anything um, that interesting. My, my uh, experience has been pretty limited to strict respiratory illnesses like bronchiolitis and asthma, but that's really interesting. Okay, Adam? Uh, no, I agree. And then the kind of what John had mentioned earlier where so many of our kind of sicker kids that may have pneumonia or some other issues probably have a degree of underlying asthma or reactive airway disease of some sort. So I feel like the when we're managing them for both their hypoxia, being able to also wash out that dead space, you know, even, even if that's not your goal to treat hypercapnia, if there's anything underlying, uh, it tends to improve them clinically as well. Cause you know, so even in the adult world in the pediatric world, seldom is it one thing just in isolation. Yeah, I think, um, so this is the next question, but I think the pediatric community, pre pediatric emergency medicine has really been a quick adopter of this type of technology because most, most departments really don't have pressure-based alternatives or don't readily use pressure-based alternatives. If you were talking to an adult colleague about a, a pediatric patient, um, how would you, um, talk, how would you relate your experience with high velocity therapy in providing the ventilatory support um, without delivering that pressure that they're, they're used to using those positive pressure devices. Uh, Adam, I'll start with you. I, both. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we, we have this conversation a lot because there's just a lot of believers that, especially in the adult world, there's just a lot of believers like, well, BiPAP works because it's positive pressure. Therefore, this isn't delivered positive pressure, so it can't work. So we'll just, and I, especially amongst the residents, so I'll run into that uh, while I'm managing our cases. So I just break it down physiologically. We talk about minute ventilation. We talk about alveolar ventilation and dead space. I'll break it down to the actual like CCs per kilogram. Then they get overloaded with information and they, uh, they start backing off. But I think once they understand that this is, you don't need to generate positive pressure to get the same effects. And again, we're not saying that positive pressure doesn't work. We're saying that this is another option that we have to manage these patients. And um, I think once people kind of break it down from that standpoint, but honestly, once they see it work, I think is when you actually, you get your believers out of it. Rebecca? Um, yeah, what I, I'm gonna say almost exactly the same thing that they did is that, you know, it comes down to that alveolar ventilation where with the pressure, you're increasing the tidal volume with the high velocity, you're decreasing the dead space. So the outcome is the same. All right. So earlier, you guys all mentioned that you kind of agree that you start your patients on the kind of the highest liter flow that's recommended, which is two liters per kilo. Um, how do you, once you have your patients all set up on the vapotherm, they're on that two liters per kilo, how do you titrate them or how do you decide that they're failing? And Rebecca, we'll start with you. Well, I think the first indication of failure would be, you know, altered mental status or periods of apnea. And that way, you know, at that point, you're just going to go straight to intubation anyway. As far as, um, and, and what, you know, I think if they're, if they're already on pretty high levels of, of high velocity therapy, they need to look bad, they probably need to go ahead and be intubated. 
Um, on the other hand, if you start them on a, you know, a higher flow and they immediately look much better, then I think you can titrate it and you can titrate it pretty quickly. I mean, we'll stand at the bedside and say, all right, let's go from 25 to 20 and kind of see how the patient looks. And if they start looking like they're working again, then you just turn it back up. So titrating over the short term is usually pretty um pretty quick and pretty easy to do just evaluating clinically. If the kid's been on it on the therapy for a few days, you're probably checking an occasional gas and that helps you with titration in that way. Uh, Adam? Yeah, so for, for titration, uh, I agree, I just go at the bedside and just watch them. Obviously, if you have them on 100% and they're hypoxic, increased work of breathing or just really just lethargic, you know, it just like anything, we're just going to, you know, reassess. And again, I probably wouldn't go to BiPAP and them. I would just assume that they're going to fail that and move to intubation. For the, I've had several cases in the adult population that I myself have just backed off too quickly on and realized how dependent they were on that hypercap, uh, that dead space flush. Uh, and then it's a little bit more difficult to get them back. I haven't run into that as much of backing them off too quickly in pediatrics, but I'm very cautious of it because of those kind of anecdotal experiences that you get uh, from that. So I tend to be kind of very slow, especially knowing that I don't have pediatric resources at my hospital and anyone's going to be transferred. So if they're tolerating the higher flow rates, I'll back off a little bit, but if they're not, if it's not bothering them, I usually kind of let, let them just kind of tolerate as long as possible. Now, since it can't be transported in the vapotherm, um, I'll want to back it down a bit before then because I don't want them to be used to 20 liters per minute and all of a sudden somebody puts them on four liters nasal cannula in the in the rig and then they decompensate. So I don't want that. I want them you know, improving, but I just kind of take it very, uh, uh, not very slow, but fairly slow at the bedside, but if they're tolerating it, I'm, I'm not too aggressive. All right, and John? Uh, so for me, I mean, I, my experience is very similar to Adam. I mean, they're, uh, I usually give these people about half an hour to an hour um, before I, I make any sudden changes. If they're, if they're obviously not starting to improve at, a half, at the half an hour mark, I know they're probably headed towards intubation. Uh, most of these patients, when I put someone on vapotherm, if I'm working either my adult shift or working at the purple site, I know I'm transferring them. So if I put them on vapotherm, my next phone calls to our transfer center to get them going. Lucky for us, we have pediatric transport teams who can transport patients on high flow um, and high velocity systems. So uh, for me, it's, it makes it so I don't really have to do all that much. I typically won't touch it for the first hour to hour and a half if they're clinically improving. If I know the transport team is going to be there within an hour and a half to two hours of picking them up, I just leave it alone. And at, at most, I titrate down their oxygen level. I'm going to want to go ahead and uh, kind of do anything more in the respiratory drive uh, from, from that standpoint. Uh, but if I get them on vapotherm and I know my transport team is coming, uh, I leave good enough alone. Uh, and leave it up to the uh, pick two guys or a hospital service uh, to start playing around with it at that same point. Okay. Um, in, your, in your hospitals, and you need to admit these kids, um, what care areas are they allowed to go to um, outside of the ICU, obviously? Are, are, you, are you allowing them to be admitted to pediatrics floors or step-down units or, and Rebecca? In our hospital, they have to go to the intermediate care unit only because that's the only place where we currently have monitors. And so we feel like if the patient needs to be on a monitor that somebody's actually watching, they need to be in our IMCU. We are a community hospital, so we don't have pediatric intensivists. We have pediatric hospitalists. But if we want somebody to be able to actually watch the monitor, then they're in our intermediate care unit. Great. Adam? So uh, obviously we don't keep pediatrics at my site, so they would all be transferred out. For the adult population, they just need a monitored bed. So if they're, uh, like Rick was saying, if they're sick enough to need the units, then they're on a monitored bed, but then it's just clinically, they can either be uh, just a regular tele bed, a step down or ICU. Most of the time they all need ICU though. Great, John? Uh, so our hospital has set parameters of who's allowed to go where. So essentially at our peripheral site, if you're on a, a liter per kilogram, uh, and your FiO2 is less than 50, you may be able to stay there. Um, if uh, you're at our main children's site, there actually is no flow parameters. Uh, you could be at max, uh, maxed out at uh, two liters per kilogram, uh, but the FiO2 is the cutoff point between going to the ACU and going to the floor. Our PICU doctors feel that if you're uh, sustaining yourself in an FiO2 greater than 50% and it's been more than an hour and a half or two hours, uh, regardless of flow, uh, you just have to be watched a little bit more closely. Uh, I may need a little bit more aggressive RT care than what the floor can handle. Gotcha. Great. Um, 
think we talked about weaning already. Um, in your experience with respiratory distressed kids, are there any that you wouldn't use high velocity therapy on? And John? Uh, I mean, I said this before, unless uh, intubation is, uh, is eminent when they walk in the door, uh, I'm trying high velocity therapy on every single patient who comes in uh, who is in some sort of undifferentiated respiratory distress for one reason or another. Rebecca? For me, the main issue would be apnea. And again, that's because it's something that's, you know, not uncommon in infants with bronchiolitis, uh, especially in those less than 28 days. Um, periods of apnea, um, high velocity is probably not going to help us. Um, and again, those would be babies I might consider CPAP briefly, but if they're having significant periods of apnea, they're going to need to be intubated. And Adam? Uh, same. As long as they're spontaneously breathing, I start vapotherm first on them. If they were sicker than that, or if, you know, if I have a real high suspicion that they're going to decompensate, I'd probably just go straight to intubation on them. Okay. So one of the things I get asked all the time is, is high velocity therapy indicated for X diagnosis? Is it indicated for asthma? Is it indicated for bronchiolitis, et cetera, et cetera? So the answer is vapotherm is indicated for respiratory distress of, of all types. And so I was, I'd like to hear your experiences with maybe um, presentations that weren't pure respiratory. So maybe metabolic diseases that uh, you felt would benefit from vapotherm or any other novel uses um, that you guys could teach us about. Uh, Adam, we'll start with you. So we'll use it for uh, pretty much all comers. We'll, we'll get creative with it. I've also used it for uh, up to and including intubation. So we know that uh, high flow rates, just the regular nasal cannula uh, prevents uh, or prolong safe apnea time during RSI. So again, anecdotally, I've just assumed that we've done this to my other sites. Well, if 15 liters nasal cannula works well uh, in an adult, then 40 liters must work well. Luckily, I haven't had to use it in pediatrics in that situation. Um, but those are some of the different types we've used it for. But yeah, anybody who um, I feel it fits, it's, a, it's an easy thing to place. It's an easy thing to set up and most patients tolerate it. So you don't really have too much to lose by applying it. All right, and Rebecca? I can't say that I have any uh, experience with using it uh, for anything other than specifically respiratory uh, distress. John. Uh, for me, I think at this point in my career, I probably put it on a, a wide variety of patients. Um, I put it in my congenital heart kids who show up with failure. Uh, I put it in kids with myocarditis. I put it in diabetics who are severely acidotic. Uh, my seizure kids who have a prolonged post state. Uh, who have a gag reflex, are doing something, but you're concerned about hypercarbic respiratory failure, I put it on them. Um, essentially, like I said, I put it on uh, a fentanyl overdose patients. Um, I think everything with the exception of a head injury and trauma patients, I know if they're having issues with their respiratory status, I'm going to intubate them. And any closing thoughts that you all might have um, to share with your colleagues regarding your use of high-velocity therapy? Rebecca? I would say one of the, the first things that people have to get used to doing is using higher flows than what you think. You know, when, when they talk about high flow, you know, having a low flow and a high flow circuit, I think it's eight liters. And I want to people to understand that we're not, it's not the same thing as traditional high flow. So you're really going to want to use much higher flows than what you typically think of. So, you know, starting a, uh, a larger kid at, at 10 liters is probably not giving you the, the, the flush, the flush that you really need and to start at higher flows than what you're kind of accustomed to. And John? Um, I always kind of harbor the home that this is a, this is a high velocity system uh, and not necessarily just high flow oxygen. Uh, and that people look at it and they see the nasal cannula, it looks like a regular nasal cannula. Uh, and they really don't feel like they're doing a lot. Um, what I've gotten to say, I said, people put it on. Uh, and that's what I told like, and, and see, see how it feels like. Uh, and you can actually feel a difference when you wear it. Uh, even as you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, I could just sit there and probably not breathe and probably get plenty of oxygen uh, from, <laughs> from that standpoint. But uh, I say the, the concerns of the, you know, the small prongs are like, well, you know, I'm told bigger prongs are bigger. You have to have a pop-off valve, extra pop-off valve. 
Um, you know, so I think talking people through the process and then letting them try it uh, and then trying to get them to, to see how it works. You know, I've shown people, people I'm working in my own department where I put them on the, the Vapotherm system and I'm like, guys, take a look at I me. Mean, I've gotten this person better. And I think seeing is believing. And Adam. Yeah, I agree with everything you guys said. Uh, two things that I run into a, a, a decent amount is people have a mental problem. Sometimes it's kind of difficult with the mental flexibility of separating the flow from the O2 because they're so set on it. So you'll see 40 liters per minute in an adult or 20 liters per minute in a kid and they'll freak out. Like, That's way too much oxygen. You have to take a step back. No, these are, you have to understand the, to use this appropriately, you have to understand the mechanism and why this works. So kind of separating that out and showing them how easy it is to titrate between the two. Some people need more FiO2, some need uh, more flow rate. And I also like just stressing to people like, look, this isn't the same as like, a GE versus a Sharp versus a Philips microwave or something like that. These aren't just different brands of the same thing. You can't compare this to apples to apples to another high flow machine, just like you can't compare it apples to apples to a bypass machine. They're different technologies. So you have to understand why we're choosing this technology and why it's different. And I think what you get that, because it, it, from a mechanism of action, it's, the, it's kind of beautifully simple. It's not that complex a concept they have to get. It's not high grade acid base stuff. You know, they, they can understand it. And then once they realize like, oh, this makes sense. This is why it works for all these different patients. Um, it, it seems to help. But those are kind of the two things I kind of really try to harp on with uh, new users and kind of, especially docs and uh, respiratory therapists that might be a bit hesitant. Yeah, 